morning. I'm uh, Peter Shergold. I'm the Chancellor of the University of Western Sydney. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this e important forum on behalf of the University. Today's symposium is a partnership between the Whitlam Institute, which is within the University, and our School of Business. I am confident that today's topic, which is on expanding the economy, is going to allow us to explore some original perspectives, instigate some important debates about growth and well-being and prosperity. And I hope it's going to enlarge and enhance debate about important issues of public policy. I think it's extraordinarily timely. It's clear that changes are afoot in terms of how we relate economic growth to national prosperity and the well-being of citizens. Towards the end of last year, I wrote a little online opinion piece on the attempts now being taken by nations to measure the interwoven threads of economic progress. I examined, for example, the Better Life Index that's been developed by the OECD. And it comprises 11 dimensions, including things such as life satisfaction, work-life balance, safety. Australia, incidentally, ranks very near the top on that OECD index. We rank far higher than we would simply on the basis of traditional cost of living measures, or standard of living measures. I also looked at the work being undertaken by the UN Development Programme, which again reports on measures such as national health and education to counter what the UNDP proclaims as an excessive obsession with the creation of material wealth, which can obscure the ultimate objective of enriching human life. So this symposium starts from the proposition that it is absolutely vital to discuss how to stimulate Australia's economic growth, how to raise productivity, how to lift workforce participation, but, but is also premised on the belief that Australia needs to have a wider debate about the purposes of growth and how to measure its value to society. The inspiration for that little blog I wrote was, of course, the oratorical brilliance of Robert Kennedy back in 1968. And you can still go online and listen to that speech, and I guarantee it still brings up the hair on the back of your, your neck. Because he argues, of course, in his speech that traditional statistics per capita GDP does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. I think those powerful words are a worthy introduction to this symposium and to our first session. So here's the, uh, the title of the talk, Redesigning the Economy, Recognizing Its Embeddedness in Society and, and the Rest of Nature. So I think there's some, some key ideas and changes in um, the way we look at the world embedded in that, in that title, recognizing that people are part of the natural world, recognizing the economy is embedded in a culture, a society, and that's embedded in a natural system, which has limits. Um, I've been working recently with the country of Bhutan, and if you haven't, haven't heard, their, uh, their national policy goal is gross national happiness, not gross national product. Um, and they've been following that for, for a number of years, but they're, they're now, I think, beginning to get really serious about trying to figure out what that means. And convening um, a group of countries and individuals around the world uh, to pursue that goal. How do we develop <clears throat> a new economic paradigm based on uh, changing our fundamental goals towards well-being, uh, sustainability, uh, hap human happiness, 
uh, rather than uh, the conventional goals of, of uh, GDP growth. They actually managed to get a um, resolution passed unanimously through the UN uh, that uh, this is in fact what countries should be pursuing, is the well-being and happiness of their populations. And there was a, um, an event at the UN last April 2nd with about 800 attendees to follow up on that. This is a website you can go and visit uh, with some of the background information uh, from that meeting. And I'm now, uh, I'll be chairing a working group that they have to sort of further elaborate uh, some of these ideas. So I think there is growing um, international interest in, in this issue of how do we move beyond uh, simply measuring GDP, how do we actually figure out what we mean by sustainable well-being and, and quality of life, and how do we achieve those goals. This is a complex problem. And solving any complex problem like this requires, I think, the integration of these, these uh, three elements of having an adequate vision, not only of how the world works, our scientific paradigms, our understanding of the world, and this is certainly changing quite rapidly as we learn more about uh, the way natural systems function, uh, but also as we learn more about human psychology. Uh, there's the whole field of positive psychology, as it's called now, that, uh, that that is the study of what actually leads to human well-being as opposed to what leads to, to, to mental illness. Um, and I think there's uh, integrating <coughs> these new understandings about uh, uh, humans and their place in the world, I think, is, is an essential element of this. But there's also the other part of it, which is how we would like the world to be. So <coughs> how do we develop uh, a shared vision of the kind of world that, uh, that, we, that we really want? And this process of envisioning and scenario planning and, and having that discussion, I think it's really the essence of what democracy should be about, uh, to have that community discussion. Where, what are our goals? And, uh, and then we can decide how to get there, our tools and analytical techniques, our implementation strategies and institutions and policies, et cetera. But what we haven't <clears throat> had recently, I think, is a, a really thorough discussion of what our goals, uh, our goals are or what they should be. Um, it's also important, I think, to take a much longer term view of humanity's presence on the planet. Um, another project I'm involved with is called IHOPE, the Integrated History and Future People on Earth, which is an attempt to put together uh, the environmental history of the world, which we're learning a lot more about from ice cores and tree rings and the, the emphasis on climate change, uh, with what we know about human history and how those environmental and human factors have interacted over long time periods. I know you probably can't see this graph very well, it's quite complex, but what this is is an attempt to put together, at least on the same page, some of those environmental and human variables starting on a log scale at 10,000, 100,000 years ago uh, up to the present. And I'll just point out a couple of things on this. The, uh, the red line is the temperature record um, going back to 100,000. Humanity, Homo sapiens as a species has been around for maybe two or 300,000 years. Um, <clears throat> for the first couple hundred thousand, um, we were in the Pleistocene era when uh, the temperature was fluctuating quite rapidly from ice ages to interglacial periods. And you can see at the beginning of the Holocene, around 10,000 years ago, the temperature stabilized at a quite, quite warm and wet uh, period. And this, in a sense, allowed human civilization to, uh, to flourish and all of these human variables, GDP and population, et cetera, uh, started to grow exponentially with some interesting fluctuations. And so the study of historical civilizations and what has led to their sustainability or collapse, as uh, Jared Diamond's book has done, you probably have, have heard of, have seen that one. Uh, but a better understanding of that interaction, I think, can help us um, not to predict the future, but to create um, a better, more sustainable future. You can see that this temperature line is now starting to drift off of this long-term trend. And I think that's part of, um, part of the issue. How do we understand the implications of our effects on uh, the biophysical uh, life support system of the Earth? And how do we understand what has caused the collapse of, of historical societies and, uh, and do a better job this time? We know, for example, uh, that this, the world we live in is a complex, nonlinear, adaptive system. It has thresholds and tipping points and, non, and, uh, and surprises. Uh, so we cannot expect uh, things to go uh, smoothly. Uh, this is from a paper by Tim Linton et al. that just identifies some of the potential 
tipping points in the climate system, including the melting of the ice sheets, but also some other, uh, some other things like the changes in the Indian monsoon or the dieback of the Amazon rainforest. All of these things could change the climate quite dramatically and, and much more rapidly than, than uh, just the sort of standard predictions um, um, project. So how do we understand the way these complex systems function and stay away from uh, the potential uh, tipping points? We also know that uh, on the resource side, uh, global oil production is, is peaking if it hasn't already peaked. Uh, and it's probably not even that uh, positive of a picture because the net energy from future uh, oil and gas uh, supplies is, is going to decrease much more rapidly than the, than the gross energy as it becomes harder and harder to to find, extract, process uh, these, uh, these resources. So there are fundamental resource constraints. There are fundamental ecological constraints or planetary boundaries. Uh, this is from a paper that um, myself and several others were involved with recently that tried to identify what the safe operating space, if you will, for humanity was within the biophysical constraints of the, of the planet that we live on. And we identified these nine uh, planetary, uh, potential planetary boundaries. Uh, and you can see that three of them are already well outside what we identified as the safe operating space, climate change, biodiversity loss, and the nitrogen cycling. So we have to recognize that uh, we do live on a finite planet, and we are exceeding uh, uh, this, or operating outside the safe operating space on some of the, the critical variables. Now this inconvenient truth is not the movie that most people are lining up to go see. Uh, so this is not necessarily, I would say, the best way to uh, create change in the system um, <clears throat> by, by telling people that we are, you know, we are doing the wrong thing. We are facing limits, which certainly we are, uh, but it's not necessarily the, uh, uh, the right approach uh, to get change to happen. So I think what we need is a third movie. We need something uh, that is a much more positive statement about how to go forward uh, to create a better world, uh, but one that stays within the planetary boundaries, one that also produces a higher level of sustainable human well-being than we're experiencing now. Even. And I think that's, that is our challenge going forward. So how do we create uh, this third movie? How do we create a sustainable and desirable future uh, that recognizes the embeddedness of the economy in society and in, in the rest of nature. So um, this is a document, I think there are a few copies uh, out there at the front table uh, that we recently put together for the UN for the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference that tries to do just that. And so some of what I'll be talking about is, uh, is embedded in that document if you want to want to learn more about it. Uh, myself and several of the co-authors that you might recognize. This is sort of a synthesis, I would say, of the ecological economics approach uh, to what that sustainable and desirable future might look like. First of all, let's go back to where we are in terms of vision. And I think this is uh, a caricature of the empty world vision, the, the conventional uh, view of the, the macro economy that that has land, labor, and capital as the primary factors of production, but uh, there's the assumption of almost perfect substitutability between these factors. So you don't really need land or natural resources. You can always substitute more labor or capital to produce GDP, goods and services, uh, marketed goods and services that are then either consumed or reinvested to build more capital so you can produce and consume more in the future. Uh, so the basic premises here is, are that more is always better. Utility or welfare is largely a function of consumption. The more we consume, the better off we are. There's nothing in this vision that would prevent the economy from growing indefinitely. So the idea is that, uh, that uh, we're really after maximizing uh, the rate of growth of the economy. Poverty is uh, assumed to be best solved with more growth, uh, so that you just increase the size of the pie. And don't worry about how it's distributed so much. Private property rights are always best because we're talking about marketed goods and services that are, uh, that are uh, easily handled in a private market. So the problem is we don't live in that empty world any longer. We live in what you might call a full world uh, that has to now recognize that we live in a materially closed Earth system, that these four basic types of capital or assets 
uh, are all required in some sort of balanced way to produce any sort of benefits for, for humanity, including conventional economic production. And, they, um, and they're not infinitely substitutable. Uh, so in addition to our built or manufactured capital, our human capital or, or labor, we also have our social capital, all of our uh, formal and informal interactions and networks and institutions, all of the interactions between people um, <clears throat> are extremely important, as, as is our natural capital assets, everything else in the world. So all of these are required to produce conventional goods and services, but also many of them benefit people without ever going through the market economic, conventional economic uh, production process. So they directly affect well-being and, and happiness. And on the consumption side, it's more and more clear that it's sort of relative consumption rather than absolute consumption that mostly affects people's sense of, of, of well-being. Uh, <clears throat> so, and recognizing that we live in a, a finite, materially closed Earth system. So there's not, there are limits to the, um, to the size of the material economy within this, within this system. So our challenges are really, I think, to better understand what does contribute to human well-being, what does contribute to the sustainability of that well-being, <clears throat> and, uh, and how do we build a sustainable future. Recognizing that um, that is, um, the ultimate end that we're, we're trying to achieve. Sustainable human well-being within this finite planet. Um, and, the, the dependent, and the dependence of that end on various uh, intermediate ends and intermediate means and our ultimate means of energy and resources. Um, so this is one attempt to put together some of the aspects of quality of life, well-being, uh, et cetera, from, from uh, what's been studied. Uh, there's a lot of research, as I said, on this idea of subjective well-being. There are people out there surveying um, people around the world, uh, asking them how satisfied they are with their lives. Uh, the Gallup organization has done a global survey, and the World Value Survey has, has uh, before that, has sur surveyed people everywhere, <clears throat> asking them how, how happy they are. That sense of subjective well-being uh, depends then on how this basic set of human needs uh, are being fulfilled or met. And that can vary, uh, the weightings that people give to that can vary depending on their personalities, their cultures, etc. But there's a much broader set of basic human needs than simply subsistence, consumption, etc. I think that's the, the key thing. Um, <clears throat> leisure certainly is an important part. Participation in uh, decision making is important. Creativity, freedom, um, understanding, um, appreciation, affection, etc. Um, <clears throat> all of these things have been shown psychologically to be important basic human needs, and they're not necessarily hierarchical in the Maslow sense, in that people often um, will give up even some subsistence in order to have better participation, for example. What we can do from a policy perspective is to provide the opportunities, the capabilities for people to meet those needs that sense, feel the sense of uh, well-being by how we arrange our assets broadly are built, our human, our social, and our natural capital assets, and how we allocate our, our time. So understanding how all of these elements interact <clears throat> to produce sustainable well-being, I think, is our ongoing challenge. This is some of the data from the life satisfaction surveys that I mentioned, uh, plotted against GDP per capita. And you can see that, at first, there's quite a strong relationship between increasing GDP and increasing life satisfaction. But beyond a certain point, uh, it really doesn't continue to make much difference. Um, the USA over here is, you know, has a, a four times the per capita GDP as Venezuela, but, but uh, the Venezuelans are, are equally satisfied with their lives. That's our Costa Rica, for example. So beyond a certain point, um, certainly up to a certain point, it's, uh, it's very important to have uh, a, a level of sufficient consumption and production. But beyond a, point, a certain point, it doesn't seem to make too much more difference in terms of improving life satisfaction, at least. We know also that um, the contributions of natural capital, uh, the ecosystem services that natural capital provides are extremely important to providing uh, human well-being. Ecosystem services are the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems. Uh, so this way of reframing the argument also gets us past the idea of you know, the environment versus the economy. It recognizes that the environment provides 
uh, ongoing services and that are essential uh, to, uh, to human well-being and the economy more broadly conceived. Uh, so they're as much a part of our, our asset base as, uh, as anything else. And we need to balance then the contributions of our natural, human, social, and built capital assets toward the production of human well-being and this, this interaction. So ecosystem services are the relative contribution of uh, natural capital <clears throat> to human well-being. They don't flow directly to human well-being. It's they require the interaction with these other forms of capital. So studying this, studying human well-being inherently requires a, a really transdisciplinary approach, a more integrated approach to the study of uh, <clears throat> humans and the rest of nature. Some basic facts about ecosystem services uh, that they're, the, as I just said, the contributions of ecosystem structure and function, but in combination with these other inputs to human well-being, they represent a significant contribution to sustainable human well-being. We estimated several years ago uh, that that contribution um, globally was um, on the order of $33 trillion per year, much larger than global GDP at the time. Um, so we can estimate that, that contribution crudely, but, but I think it's, uh, it's clear that it's at least the same order of magnitude, if not significantly larger than our conventional economic production. These services are being threatened and degraded by human activities, and that um, <clears throat> this is a good way to understand those trade-offs and synergies and uh, on which decision-making can be based. And that finally, that um, these are not resources that uh, can or should be allocated using conventional market mechanisms. They're generally common property or or uh, public goods, and so we need. Uh, new sorts of institutions in order to, to manage these resources effectively. For example, you can classify um, goods and services according to these, these two categories of rival or non-rival. Are, are they rival goods or things that one person's benefiting from them prevents other people from, from also benefiting? Non-rival is the reverse. Um, excludable services are things that are easy enough to prevent other people from benefiting from unless they pay you. So market goods and services are largely things that are rival and excludable. And these other categories are not well handled by, by market allocation mechanisms. So we need <clears throat> different sorts of institutions, uh, government or non-government kinds of institutions that can actually take the public goods character of these systems into account. It's also clear that the distribution of wealth and resources is extremely important in terms of uh, a whole range of uh, social problems and to sustainable quality of life. This is from a recent book by uh, Wilkinson and Pickett called The Spirit Level, where they um, collected data on income inequality by country in uh, the OECD countries versus this whole uh, index of um, health and social problems, life expectancy, infant mortality, etc. And you can see there's a quite strong correlation between the, the level of income inequality and the, uh, this index of, of social problems, uh, the USA being way up here in the upper, upper right-hand corner. And in the US, it's interesting that um, they did a survey recently uh, that asked, asked people, uh, first of all, here's the actual distribution of wealth in the United States right now, uh, the top 20% of the population more than 80% of the, the wealth in the country. They asked Americans, though, uh, you know, what they thought the wealth distribution was currently, and they got this distribution, and they asked them what they would like it to be, and they got this distribution, which is pretty close to the distribution of wealth in Sweden. So most Americans actually would rather have the, the Swedish distribution of wealth. Um, this didn't come out in the presidential debates, I don't think, at least, at least not yet. Um, <clears throat> so. Are there alternative indicators? We heard, we heard already uh, some of the uh, issues and problems with GDP, and uh, it's well known, I think, that GDP was never designed as a measure of economic well-being or welfare. Uh, it was really only designed as a measure of economic production or ac activity, and only the marketed part of that, that activity. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the problem is really that we use it for the wrong purposes. Um, but there have been some attempts to create alternative indicators, and this is a particularly interesting one, I think. The uh, ISEW Index of Sustainable Economic Welfare, or renamed the Genuine Progress Indicator, 
which was uh, developed by Herman Daly and John Cobb back in 1989. And uh, it starts with personal consumption expenditures, which are a major component of GDP. But then it weights them by the income distribution to take into account the fact that if you're talking about welfare, a dollar's worth of income to a rich person doesn't produce as much additional welfare as a dollar's worth of income to a poor person. Um, <clears throat> if you're talking about welfare instead of income, you've got to worry about the distribution of that, of that uh, income. It adds a couple things that are left out of GDP, like the value of household labor and volunteer work, um, which are obviously good things, but they're not marketed, so they're, they're not included in GDP. And it subtracts a whole bunch of things that shouldn't be in there, like the cost of crime and family breakdown and underemployment. All these things in red are social capital components, a few human capital components, the loss of leisure time. Uh, and all the green things are natural capital components, the cost of air and water and noise pollution, etc. So not the perfect indicator by any means, but, but it's something that does at least try to get at um, some of the issues that, that we're talking about. How do we take into account the social and the natural capital uh, and human capital components and come up with more of a net indicator of, of uh, e at least economic welfare uh, that uh, going forward get some really interesting results, if you haven't seen these before. In the US, for example, um, GDP from 1950 to post-2000 was, uh, was on an upward trend with a few minor recessions. GPI, on the other hand, was strongly correlated with GDP up until about 1975 or so, at which point it's leveled off and actually started decreasing. Uh, so <clears throat> the increasing um, maldistribution of wealth and the environmental externalities uh, that, that were caused by this increasing GDP uh, are now balancing out the, uh, the positive effects of that, that growth in, uh, in, in production and consumption. Um, the state of Maryland recently became, the, I think, the first official government body uh, to adopt the GPI, the Genuine Progress Indicator, as one of their official state statistics. And you can go look at this website. I think they did a really good job of explaining this indicator, all of its various components, and what went into them, the data sources, and, and also what they plan to do to now start to focus on the GPI more than on GDP. Uh, they uh, recently released this press release uh, showing that in, uh, in the last year, even though GDP uh, was decreasing, I think, uh, their GPI has uh, increased by, by, by 2% and uh, what they had to do in order to get that. So uh, <clears throat> they're beginning to take these ideas much more seriously on board and try to focus their policy efforts on improving at least a better approximation to what we mean by, uh, by well-being uh, than, than GDP. The state of Oregon, is all, I mean the state of um, Vermont, has also recently adopted the GPI and we've been working with the state of Oregon. Recently we did a, uh, an estimate of the GPI for, for Oregon, comparing that with Maryland and with the U.S. average. So there's quite a bit of variation from state to state, from country to country uh, in, in GPI. And we can begin to understand you know, what has caused that and uh, <clears throat> begin to focus more on improving uh, GPI rather than, than GDP. Uh, we've also looked across different countries uh, to look at their uh, GDP and GPI and comparing them with some, several other indicators. This is all done on uh, an index basis, so every, all these numbers are indexed with 1985, I think, as, as 100, uh, just to show you the trends. And again, this is the U.S. with a very strong correlation between the two up until about 1975 or so, and then GDP continues up, GPI, the red line, uh, levels off. Um, how does this compare with the ecological footprint in the U.S., uh, which has been relatively stable, the biocapacity, which has been trending down, uh, and with life satisfaction, which has been uh, pretty much unchanged over that, that whole period. Um, this is the U.N.'s Human Development Index, which is a combination of uh, GDP per capita spending on health and, and education. <clears throat> it's been going up, trending up, but just slightly in the U.S. and in many other countries. If you compare that, for example, with Sweden, you get a uh, sort of similar uh, kind of result, very strong correlations up to a point after which GDP continues to go up, GPI levels off, HDI has improved, but, uh, but not, not that much. And some other interesting examples. Just look at the scale on this one. So this, this goes up from 100 to 180 for Sweden, 
and here it's from 100 to 400 for China, um, showing their you know rapid growth of GDP, uh, and <clears throat> at least an initial uh, correlation with GPI. But since about 1995 or so, the Chinese GPI has, has significantly leveled off. And if you've been to Beijing or Shanghai recently, uh, <clears throat> you know that the air pollution, water pollution, and, and also the distribution of income has gotten significantly worse in China uh, over the last several, several decades. Another interesting example in the former Soviet Union of uh, Poland, where uh, GDP is the, the blue line, uh, you can see here, had some significant uh, fluctuations during that transition period, and then sort of took off rapidly afterwards. Uh, GPI uh, took a crash there during that transition, but has recovered uh, somewhat as well. So we recently did a, uh, a global analysis and looked for all of the, the countries for which the GPI had been estimated. We found 17 countries for which it had been done. You can see Australia is here at the, at the top of the heap. Uh, so the GPI, as, uh, as, as was mentioned before, and by other indicators, uh, Australia actually does quite, quite well. Uh, although it's, it's sort of leveled off, it's been gradually increasing uh, since the, the 1980s. Many other countries have had this increase in GPI and then a, a leveling off at some point uh, in the past. Here's Poland again and uh, China and India down here. So we had data for all of these countries which represent a little more than half of the global population. From that we were able to put together at least the first estimate of the global GPI per capita versus the global GDP per capita. So at the global scale, <clears throat> you get a similar sort of result to what you get at the, at the U.S. scale. That's after about 1978 or so. Uh, even though GDP was continuing to go up, GPI had leveled off and, and was headed uh, slightly down. So this emphasis on growth in GDP uh, is essentially not sustainable. It's not sustainable because we are past approaching or exceeding planetary boundaries. Uh, we're beginning to affect the sustainability of our, our life support system. Uh, but it's also not necessarily desirable. It hasn't really improved uh, economic welfare and, and broader measures of well-being, <clears throat> I'm certain, would, would, uh, would show similar kinds of results. Uh, so how do we get to what, um, what Oxfam has called the, uh, the donut, the sustainable and desirable donut? How do we create <clears throat> the maximum amount of well-being and quality of life uh, within the planetary boundaries that we, that we know exist on the planet. So, we need to develop, redesign the economy, if you will, to, to take on board this different vision of, of the world uh, that uh, has these three dimensions, that it maintains a sustainable scale or magnitude or size of the economic subsystem that respects ecological limits and planetary boundaries. That, um, creates a fair distribution of resources uh, to protect the capabilities for flourishing of, of people around the, around the world. And that has a more efficient allocation of resources that includes um, all of the, um, the assets that contribute to human well-being, including our natural and social capital assets, which are not currently included in the, in the market system. Some example types of policy reforms is we need to reverse the emphasis on uh, consumerism, the idea that consuming more will make people happier. We know that that's, that's not the case. Um, <clears throat> we need to expand the common sector of the economy, if you will, the sector that deals with our common assets, the atmosphere, the oceans, etc. We can no longer allow those, those assets to, um, to be open access resources. Uh, so things like um, uh, cap and trade systems or taxes on carbon emissions or ecological tax reform, etc., cetera, uh, are mechanisms that we could use to, uh, to better manage uh, the commons on behalf of, of, uh, of, of everyone. Systematic caps on natural resources, for example. And also this idea of how do we um, focus more on employment um, as really a source of well-being and not just a way to make money to, to buy stuff, which we know doesn't necessarily continue to lead to, uh, to, 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 uh, to higher well-being. <clears throat> How do we deal with sharing uh, the work more equitably? Um, recently, Peter Victor, a Canadian economist, uh, wrote a book called Managing Without Growth. 
And he tried to ask, ask and answer this question. Well, could you have an economy that's not growing, that still actually does provide uh, these, these kinds of, uh, of services? And he created a uh, computer model of the Canadian economy. And um, this is just a summary. He said that, yes, you could have a, a no-growth disaster if all you did was stop, stop the economy from growing and left all the other policies the same. Things would not be good. You'd have rising unemployment and you know, all the things that, we, that, uh, that one initially hears about what would happen if we, if we stopped growth. However, uh, he also um, modeled a, a better no or low growth positive economy where GDP per capita had stabilized, but at the same time poverty, unemployment, greenhouse gas emissions all decreased to, um, to fairly low levels. Uh, so there are a set of policies that, that were required in order to get there, and I think that's the, uh, the kind of, of thing that we need to look at. So he, um, he identified 12 things that needed to change to create this better, more sustainable world where GDP was not increasing, but well-being uh, perhaps was. First, we need new meanings and measures of success. So we need things like GPI uh, rather than, than GDP. And again, I'm not saying that GPI is the perfect thing, but it's certainly a step in the right direction, and it gives us some, some very interesting alternative ways of thinking about uh, what we're trying to do. We need limits on materials, energy, wastes, and land use change to stay within the planetary boundaries that we've, uh, that we've identified. And we need to recognize that we, the world is not infinite. Uh, we live on a finite planet. We need more meaningful prices. Uh, the current set of prices that we're dealing with excludes um, a lot of very important external effects, external costs and benefits. And so the market is really not telling us the truth about the, the costs of the things that we're, that we're buying. And so we need to internalize those costs um, uh, more effectively. We need more durable, more repairable products. So uh, not planned obsolescence, but things that, that uh, can increase the efficiency of the, the products that we do produce and their, and their use. Fewer status goods, more non-consumption, uh, uh, kinds, uh, kinds of benefits. More informative uh, advertising. Sweden already bans advertising to children. I'm not sure what the case is here in, in Australia, but uh, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the advertising needs to inform us about what the products that we're buying can do, but not try to change people's uh, values. Better screening of technology. Technology is certainly a good servant, but it's a poor master. So we need to focus uh, technological change on the things that, that improve well-being. More efficient capital stocks, likewise with the um, uh, more durable goods and services. More local and less global in terms of production, particularly of commodities like food uh, that have to be transported over long distances. And reduced inequality. I think this is a, a critical one. Um, We've seen that this has a tremendous effect on, on a whole range of social problems, but also on our ability to build the social capital that is essential to, to drive not only the conventional economic production, but, but also quality of life more generally. Less work, more leisure. Uh, so how do we, uh, I'm just reading a paper that you know, Keynes uh, <clears throat> back in the, in the 30s predicted that by now we would have a work week of 15 hours. Um, <clears throat> so it hasn't quite gone in that, in that direction. Uh, but uh, one of the things that Peter Victor identified as being a critical factor in producing this sort of low growth economy was to reduce the, the average number of, uh, of hours worked across the, the population. Um, so, <clears throat> and if, um, if people recognize that their leisure time, which can be spent, you know, uh, interacting with friends and family and building social capital, uh, doing volunteer work, doing other things that actually do improve social well-being uh, can be much more productive and fulfilling than the time we spend uh, working for pay. Um, and finally, education for life and not just for work. Uh, how do we get back to the idea of educating people uh, more broadly, not just to have a job, uh, but to have a fulfilling life? So of course, there will always be skeptics, and this guy is asking, well, what if it's all a big hoax and we create this better world for nothing? I think it's time that we really focus on <laughs> creating the better, the better world and communicating that that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, that <clears throat> um, we can improve sustainable well-being, uh, but in order to do that, it's going to take a change in our basic vision, our basic uh, attitude 
uh, and our basic goals. Uh, so we need to also just break our addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm uh, to fossil fuels and to overconsumption. Even George Bush admitted that we were addicted to, to, uh, to oil. Or we're addicted to, I think, the whole, the whole system that we're, we're embedded in. And I think that's why it's been so difficult to change. Uh, that it's not, uh, it's not simply pointing out that this is a, uh, you know, a better way. Uh, the worst thing you can say to an addict is you're doing the wrong thing. You get, you know, initially you get defensive, a defensive reaction and, and denial. Um, so it's, it's going to take some therapy. Um, and uh, one of the most effective kinds of therapy is to think of well, what does this more sustainable and desirable future look like. Uh, let's create some positive visions of that, of that future. And I think that's, that's our, our joint challenge, is to, to look broadly for uh, solutions for the kind of world that we really want. Um, so this is a, um, a new hybrid academic popular journal uh, that, I'm, that I'm editing called Solutions. I, I invite you to take a look at this, uh, where we are trying to have this broader conversation. No more than a third of our articles can be about describing the problem, and two thirds have to be about describing the solutions. Uh, so, how do we build this shared understanding of how the world works and the kind of world that we really want uh, in order to, to, uh, to help get us there? And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.